Prix is currently held at the Silverstone Circuit in England, one of the most famous racetracks in the world. The first Grand Prix and the first World Championship race was held there. I'm super excited today to have an expert from the Silverstone Circuit in England on our show. Matt Battersby is the Vice President and Chief Behavioral Scientist from RGA. The RGA is the reinsurance group of America and they've grown to become the only international company to focus primarily on life and health related reinsurance. Matt will tell us about the behavioral science of selling life insurance. We coined the episode the human and the machine and we asked Matt to link it to Formula One. Matt, welcome. Great. Um, thank you for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be with you all the way from London today. Formula One is the perfect combination of the human and a machine. As a sport, to be successful and win races, you need a car at the forefront of science and you need a body and mind at the peak of athletic performance. As entertainment, as Drive to Survive has shown, it's not just the physical drama, it's the human drama that matters as well. For me, this is a, a good analogy for the future of life insurance. For many years, the focus has been on technology, on digitizing the sales, underwriting and claims process. Much of this work has been essential, but there's a growing realization that perhaps the pendulum needs to swing back towards the human. Um, and that some of the assumptions we've had around the technology we've created need to be questioned a little bit more. We know that consumers expect everything to be easy and at the touch of a button. Uh, and so the answer to the protection gap problem is to make buying life insurance easier. Okay, simple, that's the answer, but I think not. I believe that the pace of technological change has sometimes led us to overestimate how much and how quickly human behavior has changed. And we forget a key thing, and that is life insurance, buying life insurance is not natural human behavior. So if we're really to close the protection gap, we need to combine a real understanding of human behavior with the best technology. And this is where behavioral science comes in. So behavioral science brings together insights from from all the human sciences, from psychology, sociology, economics, etc., and using a scientific and evidence-based approach, applies them to consumer decision-making and behavior. So in this presentation, I'm gonna give a short introduction to behavioral science, explain some of the key principles and why these principles don't change as much as you might think they do. I'll then explain what it means for selling life insurance and stress that we must avoid thinking that life insurance can be sold in the same way that Amazon sells books or Netflix sells content. And instead, we need to focus on identifying and awakening the true human needs that can motivate the purchase of protection. I'll conclude that just like Formula One, we need to merge the best of both the human and the machine. Um, and also, just like Formula One, we need to be conscious of our history and what's worked well in the past. But let's start with this short introduction then to behavioral science and why we behave in the ways that we do. So here in front of you is, is Hatfield House. Uh, it's about 30 miles outside of London. Unfortunately, it's not my home. It's a, uh, an old historic building. It was built over 500 years ago. It was originally a royal palace and the, uh, the childhood home of Elizabeth I. Um, it's very grand, very historic. For anyone who's seen Downton Abbey, this is Downton Abbey times 10. Um, still living in by the Earl of Salisbury, but it's open to the public every summer. Uh, I actually visited here a few years ago with my family. Uh, lots of rooms to look around, lots of antiques, paintings, suits of armour, etc. And lots of old furniture, especially old chairs. There must be close to 100 antique chairs uh, in the building. And when I was walking around, I started to notice this. On almost every chair, there was a pine cone. Uh, trust me, it is a pine cone. I had to check that at first. It's nothing more suspicious than a pine cone. Uh, first of all, I thought oh, this must be an accident. Perhaps a child has put them there. Uh, but there was hundreds of them. On every chair, there was a pine cone in the building. Uh, so I was curious. At the end of my tour, I asked one of the guides why this was the case. Um, and he explained to me that they had a real problem with people sitting on these chairs. People get tired as they're walking around, so they want to sit down. But the chairs are antique. They're very old and very fragile, very valuable. Um, so what they realized was um, they needed to stop people doing this. Now, initially, what they did is they put a sign up in every room saying, you know, these chairs are, uh, are, are, are delicate, they're valuable, please don't sit on them. 
but it didn't work. Well, they thought, well, perhaps people aren't seeing the sign, so maybe we need to put another sign up at the, you know, both sides of the room. Still didn't make a difference. The multiplied and multiplied the number of signs until above every chair there was a sign saying, please don't sit on these chairs. But it still wasn't making a difference. It wasn't solving the problem. So eventually I thought, well, let's try something completely different. We'll take every um, sign down and we'll just put a pine cone on every chair. And this has almost completely solved the problem. Um, why is that? Well, people look at this and go, oh, there must be a reason why this pine cone is on the chair. I don't want to have to move the pine cone to sit on it. Um, so it kind of deters some people, but also it makes people like me go and ask, why is this the case? What's happening? Uh, and then in that process, you learn why you don't need to sit on the chairs. Now, I use this as an uh, intro to behavioral science because I think it shows that people don't always behave in the ways you might think they do. So people don't just react to education and information. People are motivated and influenced by lots of different factors. Um, so this is universal. People don't always behave in the ways that we might think they do. Now, interestingly, the last business trip I did before COVID struck two years ago was in South Africa. Just as COVID was sweeping the world, I was, I was in South Africa on the business trip. Uh, and I had a spare day at the weekend and I went to visit Stellenbosch. And I was looking around some of the historic houses there and I saw the exact same signs that had originally been at Hatfield House in London here in one of these old, old buildings. And what I think this just demonstrates is, you know, yes, there were cultural differences around human behaviour around the world, but actually human behaviour is pretty similar from culture to culture. We face the same issues, we face the same behavioural challenges, uh, and so we need to apply the same understanding of human behaviour wherever we go. OK, so I'm going to dig a bit more deeply into explaining why we behave in the ways we do and why things are sometimes a bit surprising. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to show you a picture, of a picture of a man. And as quickly as you can, I want you to answer to yourself, what emotion is this man showing? OK, hopefully, I think most of you would have got this pretty quickly. This, this man is angry. It's easy to see straight away. OK, anger is the emotion that's shown here. OK, on the next slide, I'm going to show you a sum. And again, as quickly as you can, I want you to answer um, in, you know, in your own mind, shout out if you want, answer. What is the, uh, the answer to this sum? OK, I've given you a few seconds there because it's a bit harder, isn't it? Um, some of you may have got it. Some of you may still be trying to work out. I'm confident that all of you could work it out. The answer is 408. It's sort of complicated sum. If you had a pen and paper, you'd be able to, to answer it if you can't answer it in your own head. We all know the answer, just as we knew the answer to the emotion that man was showing. But it just takes a lot longer to get to that answer. And this really uh, brings to life a key fundamental principle of human behaviour. And that is that we can think about the way we think and make decisions as if we have two systems operating in our brain at any one time. You have your system one way of thinking, which is your fast, more unconscious, more um, emotive way of thinking. It's often called your Homer Simpson's brain. It's your intuitive, instinctive uh, way of thinking. And that's the thinking that you use to understand that the, the emotion being shown there was anger. You were using information quickly to make a quick decision. You're using shortcuts, rules of thumb with that part of your brain. You then have system two, which is your more slower, reflective, more conscious, more deliberative, more classically rational way of thinking, often referred to as your Sherlock Holmes type of brain. This is the brain that you need to answer that sum to get to the answer 408. Now, the point about this is that you use your system one much more than you think you do. Most of the decisions you make throughout life are system one decisions. Uh, and that's needed because often you need to make quick decisions. You can't use system two, your Sherlock Holmes brain for everything. Using system two is effortful. It takes time and mental energy to, to do it. So if you want to understand more, think about, for those of you who can drive or perhaps in the process of learning to drive, think about that experience of learning to drive. When you first learn, it takes so much system two to drive to learn how to steer whilst also maybe shifting gear, checking your mirrors, all that stuff. It involves so much conscious thought that you struggle to do anything else. You can't hold a conversation with the person next to you. You can't listen to the radio. You probably can't think of anything else. 
But as you become more experienced, that becomes more habitual. It becomes more system one way of thinking. You drive on instinct. Yeah, you can drive for miles sometimes. We've probably all had this experience uh, without realizing that you've driven. You get home and you think, did I stop at those traffic lights? Did I go around that roundabout? It's become automatic. So much of our behavior and thinking is automatic. Now, this is standard. This is universal about how we, we think and, uh, and behave. We're bombarded, though, every day with stories about how technology is changing human behavior. Um, and you can imagine, you can you understand this. We can see why this is. If I am, um, you know, it's not surprising. If I get my phone out here uh, at the touch of the button, you know, in five minutes, I can book a flight to pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, in two minutes, I can order a taxi and it'll be waiting outside for me. Um, in two seconds, I can pretty much find any book ever written or ever so any song ever sung and download it. And so we get obsessed with this idea that the technology has changed us, um, uh, changed who we are. Um, an example of that is anyone above a certain age who goes to a, a music concert or a gig always thinks, well, look how people have changed. Look at all these people with their phones up in the air trying to record this. They're not even enjoying the experience of being in this concert. Um, what a fundamental change in, in, in human behaviour. But I think it's a great example of actually where the change that we see can seem more significant and profound than it really is. Why are people there at a concert filming it with their, with their phones? Well, they want to record the memory. They want something you know, for the future. They spent a lot of money on this. They want to remember the experience. But also often it's because they want to show off. They're going to post this on social media. Uh, they want the status. They want the recognition for being at this event. And we've always had this desire to capture we were there. Is that behavior really that much different to in the past when we would go around collecting autographs? One person's autograph is another person's selfie. What looks stupid to one generation looks completely normal to the others. The key point is how we do something has changed, but actually what we're doing here, it's showing others that we were there or recording a memory hasn't really changed. And definitely what hasn't changed is the why we're doing it. We want status, we want something that boosts our ego. I always think it's a bit like fashion. Fashion changes from year to year, decade to decade. Things can look pretty stupid when you look at what people wore 50, 100 years time, 100 years ago. But why people wear fashion is pretty much always the same. It's to show status, it's to be attractive, it's to be part of the in crowd. The fundamental about human behavior hasn't really changed. It's not to say there isn't any change, but so too often we focus on the superficial um, and not on the what hasn't changed, which is the more fundamental. I think uh, uh, someone who really encapsulates this well is a famous advertiser from America in the 50s and 60s called Bill Birnbach. Uh, and he said this, he said, it took millions of years for man's instincts to develop. It will take millions more for them even to vary. To, to vary. It is fashionable to talk about changing man, but a communicator must be obsessed, uh, must be concerned with unchanging man with his obsessive drive to survive, to be admired, to succeed, to love, to take care of his own. Now, I, I deliberately show a black and white picture of, of Bill there, because I think, you know, in these, these days we would not say it's just man's instincts, we'd say it's human's instincts, it's everyone's instincts to think about that. Um, but I would also say it's more than just a communicator who must be concerned with this. It must be people who create products, who design processes, etc. But I think the fundamental point there is really strong. Um, human instincts don't change dramatically from year to year. The fundamentals remain the same. Cultural norms may change, but needs don't. And a good and a relevant example for this is our need for information. What drives our seeking and use of information? So this is what I'm going to look at first. It's very relevant to life insurance because that's all about seeking information about risk and how to protect your family. So I'm going to look into the reasons why people seek or avoid information, particularly risk information. And of course, this has particular relevance in the last couple of years when we look at COVID-19 um, and how people have sought uh, and reacted to information there. To start this section, though, I want to start with a bit of a, a bit of a poll question for each of you. If I had this information, I want to ask you a question. Would you like to know if I could tell you if your colleagues view you as incompetent. So uh, a question will pop up on your screen. Please let me know. Would you like to know 
if your colleagues viewed you as incompetent. Okay, great. And now I'm gonna ask you a second question. What about if I could tell you if your colleagues viewed you as competent, would you like to know that information? Again, a poll question will appear on your screen. Please uh, enter your response. Now, actually, that little poll question there um, is me replicating um, a real life experiment that's, uh, uh, that's been run, actually been run a few times, but this one is an example of an experiment that's been run by a professor of cognitive um, psychology at UCL in London called Tally Sharot. Um, she asked people exactly the same question. Would you like to know if people, your colleagues, view you as incompetent or competent? What she found is that uh, just over half of people, about 55%, would like to know if their colleagues view them as incompetent. Inter interestingly, more than three quarters, about 80% of people, would like to know if their colleagues viewed them as competent. Now, what's interesting about that is actually these bits of information are two sides of the coin. I right? thought that it would be about equal, that people either want to know the information or don't know the information. But if you think about it a bit more deeply, you think, well, if there was going to be skewed anywhere, any direction, it would be skewed the other direction. Actually, the information that colleagues view you as incompetent is probably more useful than the information that colleagues view you as competent. If I know that all my colleagues view me as incompetent, that could be essential information. That might be the only way to save my job. I might not realise this. This gives me time and opportunity perhaps to change their perspective before I get fired. Knowing that colleagues view me as competent is it's good, it's reassuring, but perhaps doesn't change my behaviour uh, in the same way. So why is that? Why do some people want to know information uh, and not know other information, even if it might be useful for people? Um, this is an important question. It's one that behavioural scientists have been interested in for years, um, particularly as we spend most of our days making decisions about what information we're going to seek when we're online on Google, when we're in the office researching or working out which colleague to speak to about something, deciding what newspaper we want to read or television news program we want to watch. We spend most of our days seeking information. Um, behavioral science has always been interested in it, but COVID has really brought this question to the fore uh, in the last couple of years or so. Because one of the unique aspects of COVID is really, it's, it's the first pandemic of the information age. Um, there is so much information out there about COVID and has been pretty much from the start. You have websites like this run by John Hopkins or Our World in Data. Um, you had, you know, most countries at the time, you had weekly, if not daily, press conferences from government agencies. Um, the media was talking about all the time, you had social media. You could find out information on the whole, good quality information about COVID every second of every hour of every day. Never was it more easy to understand the risk that a, a, a new disease posed to you, your family, your community, etc. So technology has changed. Surely this would change human behavior. Surely we'd be more informed than ever. Now, undoubtedly there are, you know, we're probably more informed than we have been uh, about many things, but what we also found there's an increase in people avoiding risk information. The Reuters Institute in the UK did some interesting um, research around people's attitudes to news and have been measuring this over the years. They found in 2017, about half of people um, said they never actively sought to avoid the news. But in 2020, just as COVID was hitting in those first couple of months or so, this went down dramatically. Only 20% of people said they never actively sought to avoid the news. So in this occasion, you know, this hugely impactful um, uh, story. We didn't know how this was going to, um, you know, in, uh, concern us as individuals, as societies, etc. We had all this information available to us. What actually happened is more people avoided information than they ever had done before. Why is this? Why do we put our heads in the sand sometimes with COVID information? Why do we not want to know if colleagues view us as incompetent? Well, this is all about how information impacts us and information impacts us in some strange ways sometimes. So first of all, uh, information impacts our action. Um, so it changes what we do. We are looking generally to act in ways that bring rewards, avoid risks, et cetera. And so we judge a piece of information according to its instrumental utility. How useful will it be in helping me to act 
in a different and better way. A great example here is maybe a genetics test around cancer, around breast cancer, for example. Um, knowing this information can enable me to take a course of treatment or take action now that could prevent, um, uh, you know, prevent this is the, the rational classic kind of way of thinking about how information uh, changes uh, changes us and our behavior it's very important but it's not the only impact it has Inf information also has a, an effect impact an emotional impact um, information can change how we feel so it can make us feel scared happy anxious uh, therefore, we tend to judge information on its hedonic utility. What impact will this have on my emotions? Going back to that uh, genetics breast cancer uh, test example, yes, that information may help me make a better decision, but the thought of getting that information, that period when I'd have to wait for that information, the impact that information would have on me if I was found it was a negative result, I can anticipate those negative emotions. It may stop people taking uh, seeking that information in the way that you might expect. And then finally, information can also change how we think. So we all have our, um, our mental models about how the world works, our beliefs, our values, our understanding of systems. Uh, and what we really want is information that fits into that pattern that we already have. I think we're all now quite aware of this, this concept of confirmation bias. We look for information that confirms existing beliefs. And that's very true. We tend to judge information on its processing utility. How easy is this to um, combine with my existing sets of beliefs? Would it force me to really change my fundamental values, um, system behavior, uh, et cetera? This is why often when we get a piece of new information, um, if it's against our existing mental models, we say to ourselves, must I believe this? Is there a way that I don't have to believe this? Or we find a piece of information that um, supports what we already believe. We look for, can we believe this? Is there a way that I can convince myself this information I should believe? So you combine all these effects together. People often make a bit of a mental calculation. When they're seeking information, what impact will it have across these three areas? And therefore, should I seek this information or not? If you understand these ways why people don't do and don't uh, seek information, then you start to understand a lot of behaviors in, in the real world. Uh, and I think a great behavior you start to understand is the uh, impact of COVID on people seeking life insurance, looking for information about life insurance and ultimately buying life insurance. At the start of the pandemic, we all saw headlines like this about how consumers were going to be panic shopping for life insurance and you know um, it made a lot of sense if ever there was a moment where people were going to panic shop life insurance go and seek information it was going to be when this new threat was spreading around the world everyone knew about it we didn't know the consequences and it's never been easier to buy life insurance particularly online you can do it in a few minutes um, and i think it's fair to say you know we saw we've, we've seen life insurance increase in some markets you know overall it's possibly had a positive impact but I think we can all say we didn't see panic shopping. We didn't see people banging down the digital door to find out about, about life insurance. Even in this moment where you thought would be the moment that might spark life insurance uh, interest, we didn't quite see that, that change that you might have thought. Um, and for me, this takes on to a more fundamental issue here, which is um, I talk about human behaviours not changing and often staying the same, the why of why we do things staying the same. I think one thing we've got to remember, which does say the same, stay the same, which is unfortunately buying life insurance is not natural human behavior. So that takes us now on to selling life insurance. Um, if buying life insurance is not natural human behavior, what do we mean by that and what can we do about it? Well, let's think about how life insurance has traditionally been sold. Um, it's traditionally been sold by, by people like this. Uh, for people who've seen the film Groundhog Day, you might recognise this person. His name's Ned Ryerson. For people who haven't seen Groundhog Day, let me explain. Um, so in the film, the person, the star of the film, is doomed to relive the same day over and over again. The particularly miserable day, at the end of every day he falls asleep, or, or when he wakes up every morning, it's the same day repeated over and over again. And one of the jokes in the film is that every day he's approached on the street 
by an ex-school friend of his called Ned, who is now a life insurance salesman. And every day he tries to sell him life insurance in, in different ways. Um, and that's the joke, really, that if you're doomed to repeat your worst day over and over again, what could be more depressing than having to uh, have someone sell life insurance to you? Now, there's a reason why there, there's a joke. You know, in, in the US, I can only find this data in the US, but it might apply elsewhere. You know, being a life insurance salesperson regularly rates as one of the least popular jobs out there. Um, it's not fun being sold life insurance to. You. You're forced to think about death, mortality, um, et cetera. Um, now, the industry is moving away from this model in many ways. You can buy life insurance online. It's much, much more digitally focused. It's easier for companies to manage regulatory and reputational risks on a website than sometimes it is um, with agents. But I think we slightly risk sometimes moving away from this model that we forget some of the reasons for this model, some of the things we learn from this model. Um, and to explain that, I think the key point is this. It's very easy to sell sweets. Sweets taste nice, they're full of sugar. Um, you crave sugar. The emotion you get from eating sweets is joy. It's lovely. All you need to do to persuade me to buy sweets is put them in lots of colourful packaging so I can't ignore them. Uh, maybe put them down by the supermarket checkout um, so that I'm waiting a couple of minutes to be served. They're crying out to me uh, before I know I've bought a packet and I'm binge eating them on the car home. It's very easy to sell sweets. It's much harder to sell sprouts. Sprouts are good for you. You probably know they're good for you. Uh, they just don't taste very nice. If I want to sell more sprouts, it's not just a case of uh, wrapping them in colorful uh, packaging. Um, I can't just put them down by the supermarket checkout. You're not gonna suddenly find yourself impulse buying a packet of sprouts. You know, two hours later, you're halfway through the new Netflix series and you're, oh no, I've eaten so many sprouts again. That's not how it works. That's not how you sell sprouts. Now, you'll perhaps be unsurprised to hear that I think selling life insurance is a lot more like selling sprouts than it is selling sweets. Um, the, the, the emotion you get around, um, get, around get, uh, buying sprouts is disgust. You know, it doesn't taste very nice for people. Uh, for life insurance, you probably know it's good for you, um, but it doesn't taste very nice. It doesn't have that, that flavor that sweets do. Um, and if sprouts have that kind of emotion of disgust, so does life insurance sometimes. We've got to realize this. And if we look back into the history of life insurance, we'll understand it more. Um, when I was researching this topic, I was surprised just how um, against life insurance many societies have been over the years. Life insurance has been around for, for hundreds of years, but only really took off in the last 150 or so. This quote from a politician, a prime minister in France in the early 1800s. We know that in some places, the ideas of healthy morality have been so sullied and stifled by the evil spirit of commerce that insurance and in the lives of men has been authorized. But such arrangements have always been forbidden in France. Life insurance was banned, it was forbidden. It was seen as so against kind of natural human behavior. How can you put a financial price on, on life? How can you be thinking about death in that context? How can you be gambling um, with God in many instances. Buying life insurance is not natural for human behavior. We had to change as a culture over time to make it a bit more so. So the question I sometimes have is that when then, why then when we're creating digital experiences, are we forgetting that just like um, life insurance, sprouts are sold, not brought? It can't just be a case of just making it easy to buy sprouts. It can't just be a case of making it easy to buy life insurance. We've got to understand what kind of product that we're selling. One of the challenges I think we sometimes have is that we've seen such change in the last 10 or 15 years in the digital world, Facebook, Netflix, Google, etc., that we think these are the people to learn from. And in many ways, they are. If you don't believe me, watch this short video. People came to Face Mash in a stampede, right? Yeah. But it wasn't because they saw pictures of hot girls. You can go anywhere on the internet and see pictures of hot girls. Yeah. It was because they saw pictures of girls that they knew. People want to go on the internet and check out their friends, so why not build a website that offers that friends, pictures, profiles, whatever you can visit, browse around. Maybe it's someone you just met at a party. But I'm not talking about a dating site. I'm talking about 
taking the entire social experience of college and putting it online. I can't feel my legs. I know. I'm totally psyched about this too. Okay, so that is a clip from the film The Social Network about the, the birth of, of Facebook. Um, as you've seen, here's a, the, 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 the script in front of you. Um, one of the key things about, about Facebook's success is that Zuckerberg focused on what people want to do. If you see from this quote here, um, people will check out their friends, so why not build a website that offers that? Um, I'm talking about put, taking the entire social experience of college and putting it online. What Facebook sells you is sweets. You've always wanted to um, see what your friends are up to, be able to show your friends what you're up to, maybe, again, status, show off a little bit, um, to have this social experience. So Facebook just found a simpler way to allow you to do something that you've always wanted to do. It's very, it's interesting. Um, we can learn some lessons from it. But Facebook here is selling sweets. We've got to remember that we're selling sprouts. People don't have this natural desire to buy sprouts, to buy life insurance. It's not just as simple as making it easy for them to do so. So what can we do then to sell, to sell life insurance, to sell more sprouts? Uh, we've done research around this and there's lots of behavioral science literature around how you sell difficult products. And really, we believe there are six steps that you have to go through to take someone on a kind of life insurance persuasion journey so the first two steps are the emotional steps the effective uh, steps so first of all you need to uh, identify a problem and a need within your target um, audience pretty much everyone has a problem that life insurance can solve um, whether that's protecting your family's future ensuring education um, whatever you need to find that problem but importantly you also need to find the need What's the motivation that's really going to drive someone to, uh, to, to really focus on that problem? And we'll explain that in a little more detail soon. Second, you then need to awaken that need. So whilst most people have a problem that life insurance can solve, they probably don't realise they have a problem. Uh, we don't want to create problems for people. We just want people to awaken up to the, the challenges that they face. We need to awaken that need. Uh, and often that has been done with... Uh, emotional probes, really difficult questions you might ask someone. Um, where would your family live if you if they lost your salary? Would you be able to afford to stay in their homes? The kind of questions, the kind of probes that make people have an emotional reaction to the problem that exists. Once you've done that, you move on to the cognitive side. So someone's emotionally engaged in this in this question. That's when you present the ideas. And really, what you're trying to do is present an idea that directly relates to this problem that's been identified, to this need that's been awakened. Then you need to provide simple uh, illustration. And we talk about really kind of glamorized clarity. How people really don't understand how life insurance works. How can you explain it as simply as possible and relate it directly to the need that we're talking about? Once you've done that, is when you get to the behavioral point. So this is when they're actually taking the action. So then we then really do want to start talking about the price um, because only once they realize they have the need, does the price make sense? If I don't want something, it doesn't matter if it's $20 or $10 a month. I don't want it, it's all too expensive. I need to know the need for something. Uh, and often you might need to help people find the money. You know, um, No one has just money lying around. It's not un unallocated for either in spending or other saving. You'll need to show them how maybe they can reallocate the money. Uh, the challenge around that sometimes is I think we use the wrong messages. I, I, often I will hear people say, well, do you know what? The cost of life insurance is, you know, it could be as cheap as, you know, that Starbucks coffee you have uh, every day. You know, it's as cheap as that. Well, I think that's a bad message often because that Starbucks coffee I have every day is like a sweet, right? It gives me instant pleasure. I enjoy every day going to my same Starbucks, getting that coffee I enjoy. It gives me a few minutes of pleasure. I like chatting to the person behind the counter are you telling me i have to give up a pleasure every day for the rest of my life for life insurance what you need to do is help people find the money by show how by showing how they're maybe overspending on things where they have no emotional impact for so money they could save on their mobile phone bill or in some markets by switching energy suppliers people don't really care which energy supplier they have um, if you could tell them they could save enough money there to afford life insurance that's a much stronger message 
But then finally, you get to that end point where you really need someone to buy. And I know lots of clients, particularly on digital journeys, you can get people all the way through here. It's this final point, the buy now, where people, people might drop out of the process, even though they've been in it for 15, 20 minutes already. Uh, and this is why you need to remind people of the problem. You need to go back to the beginning. Why is this? Why are you doing this? Who are you doing it for? That emotional need that's driving the problem that you're trying to solve. So if you work through these six steps, this is the way to apply behavioral science uh, to selling uh, life insurance. What I'm going to do now, just for the rest of the presentation, just to finish off, I'm going to look at those first two points, identifying a problem in need and then awakening the need uh, and what we can learn about how to do that more effectively. Okay, let's start off by looking at needs and problems. And now it's easy to confuse the two, um, you know, to use it interchangeably. A problem is a need, is a need is a problem. Um, but actually, I think sometimes just because something is a problem, it's not necessarily a need. And we need to be able to disentangle the two. And a, a great example of this uh, comes from the world of, of football. Um, so actually, a person I think uh, explained this very well is a football manager, um, for those who know your English football, this is Bill Shankly, uh, Liverpool, li probably still Liverpool's most famous um, uh, manager, very successful in the, the, the 70s. Uh, and he said this at the time, he said, some people believe football is a matter of life and death. I'm very disappointed with that attitude. I can assure you it is much, much more important than that. Now, it's a funny quote. This is why it's, you know, so well known, particularly in England, because it seems a bit ridiculous, right? How can football be more important than a, than a matter of life and death? It seems ridiculous, but we also know it's kind of true, right? There are lots of things which people seem to give undue uh, concern and attention to, importance to, things that seem trivial compared to, you know, some of the bigger problems in, in your life or in the world. Uh, but I think it comes down to this point about understanding actually what are the needs that really drive um, your behaviour, because people are not always motivated by the things you might think they're motivated by. So again, another example from uh, the UK, so the National Health Service does you know, lots of testing about how you can uh, help change people's behaviours for the, for the better. They do some interesting testing around how you can get people to reduce their alcohol consumption. So they tested different messages and they started with the classic messages. So is alcohol affecting your health? Cutting down on alcohol can reduce your risk of breast and bowel cancer and liver disease. Strong message, very clear risk there. Would you want to get breast or bowel cancer? Probably not. Should be a powerful deterrent from uh, excessive alcohol. But what they found is that message is less effective than this one. Is alcohol affecting your appearance? Cutting down on alcohol can reduce your risk of saggy skin, obesity, and premature aging. Now, if we were thinking purely logically and rationally, we said, well, why is that in, um, message more impactful? Surely the risk of getting saggy skin should not be more influential on your behavior than the risk of getting bowel cancer. But we actually know this is true. If we really think about it. People are often motivated by more um, immediate and perhaps kind of aesthetic concerns uh, like that. Um, if I'm a, you know, a, a 20 year old, my, I'm more concerned about having saggy skin at 30 than I'm about getting cancer at 60. You know, this is what drives so much, you know, health behavior around the world. It's why beach body diets are still some of the most popular and effective diets out there. My motivation to look good on the beach probably outweighs my motivation to be healthy in 20 years time. So we really need to focus on the needs that people actually have rather than needs we think they should have. Now, what can these needs be? What do they look like? Um, I'm sure most of you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, in behavioral science, we tend to use this model more, uh, Manfred Max Neef's fundamental human needs. This is a piece of research that he did to understand what kind of needs are common across most cultures uh, around the world. If you look at those needs, you think the top, um, uh, the top right hand corner there of the, of the circle, protection is the one that we've typically always focused on with insurance. We have a need to protect ourselves and our families, and this is a need we're trying to dig into, maybe a bit of affection um, as well. 
Now, what you're seeing is some insurers trying to widen out those needs, tap into different types of needs. And I think this is an interesting approach, particularly in more modern societies where we have broader needs, identity, freedom, et cetera. Can we tie life insurance into this? One company I think is doing really interesting things is um, uh, one called Dead Happy in the UK. Uh, for people who don't necessarily know the, the, the slang in, uh, in the UK, if you, if you say so, dead can often mean very. So if something's dead good, it's very good. If you're dead sad, you're very sad. So dead happy, very happy, but obviously a play on words there as well. Uh, and one of the interesting things they do is that when you are applying for their insurance, <clears throat> they really focus on where that money could go and what, what you can do with that money. They call it a death wish. You're allowed to allocate your money to loads and tens, dozens of different things you could allocate your, your money to from uh, paying off the mortgage, something, you know, classic and sensible, paying for someone's education, again, classic, sensible, or turning your ashes into a diamond, um, taking your ashes to the edge of space. There's ones in there, you can get a bronze statue made of yourself. Tapping into other needs we have. Yes, we have a need to protect, but we also have a need to be remembered, to leave a legacy. Um, you know, we spend all our time on social media is expressing our identity. Perhaps life insurance is a great way to be able to do that as well. Um, really interesting idea. It'd be interesting to see how it develops um, as it goes forward. So that's about identifying different problems and needs, and perhaps we need to widen that scope when we're talking to people, particularly newer generations. But it's fair to say, I think most people, most of the time, we're still focusing on that need of protection. Which therefore leads us on to that, that, that question of how do we awaken um, that need? And to do that, we really need to understand the role of emotions, uh, once again, in decision making. Um, to explain the scary image that you see in front of you, um, some of you may have heard the story of a man called Phineas Gage. He was a railway worker in the United States in the 1800s. He was the person responsible for putting the dynamite down, making, you know, blowing up rocks, blowing up parts of mountains, etc. Unfortunately, one day he left a metal rod too close to the dynamite, it exploded, it went straight up through his skull, under his jaw, behind his eye, uh, and up through the top of his skull. Miraculously, he survived. Um, but his personality almost completely changed from being a kind of uh, personable, kind of happy-go-lucky type person. He became more irritable, found it less easy to make friendships, um, but also interestingly, uh, really lost his ability to make decisions. Uh, he now struggled to gamble. He couldn't work out what was a good risk or not. Um, he couldn't decide whether he should do A versus B. Um, now, what we now know from studying this and then future um, uh, neurological um, uh, research into people who've had the same similar brain injuries is what this did is it damaged the emotional part of Phineas's brain. And when you see the behavior of other people who've had that, we realize that actually that emotional part of the brain is needed to make decisions. Um, that actually you have people who've damaged this part of the brain who can no longer decide what food they want to eat. Um, every day. They just can't make a decision. They can't weigh up one versus the other. And that's because you need emotions often to spark the part of your brain that makes decisions and particularly makes risk decisions. You need an emotion to allow you to make a, a decision and a behavior. So if we're thinking about the need of protection and we'll need some kind of emotion to maybe wake up that need and think about that risk. A classic example of doing that is to use a kind of uh, a message that focuses very much on the facts of protection. Um, so this is an example of a, um, a startup dad cover. Um, it can cost up to 16,200 to feed a, feed a child from birth to age 18. Have you thought about who would pay for this and everything else if you died tomorrow? A kind of classic, um, difficult question, disturbing question that kind of triggers that emotional response. So can we take the traditional methods and just apply them um, online? Potentially, I, I hear from, um, from many players that these messages are still probably the most successful about driving traffic to a website and driving purchases, but it does have a downside. They're very visible, these messages. People sometimes complain about them. You can have negative comments um, about them uh, online. And I think this goes to a question which we often get asked, which is, can fear work? Is fear necessary to try and sell life insurance? Um, the evidence around that from lots of different contexts is yes, fear can work. It can make a big difference. So in health behavior change, 
um, showing risk information in a very visible, visceral, emotional way can change behavior. Smoking is an example uh, of that. But it can also backfire for some people. So smoking is a good example. For people who smoking is a core part of their identity, um, think back to that cognitive point about the impact of information. If actually I see us being a smoker as who I am, if I'm bombarded with information about this, rather than accepting the information, I may um, a backlash against the information because it threatens my ego and my sense of who I am. So this is often why you may see negative responses online to messages which are quite emotional, visceral about life insurance, because for some people it will work, for some people there may be a backlash. And I think there's a, a fundamental point here about you can have the right message sometimes, but you might have the wrong context. Um, the context really matters for when you're trying to communicate to people. Uh, the context often on social media is I'm posting photos of my, of my family holiday. I'm looking at photos of someone's trip to the zoo or the meal they're posting that they've had that, that day. Is the context always right for life insurance? There are lots of examples where people have got the context wrong. Uh, this is quite a famous one. A, a Danish politician called uh, Joachim Olsen, um, a member of the Liberal Alliance Party, a small party, um, but he was up for re-election and decided he needed to spend his money wisely. So he wanted to reach his audience, typically kind of young, progressive, liberal males. How could he reach them most effectively? He decided to advertise on online pornography websites. He thought, that's where my audience is. I'll take my message to them. Um, as you may not be surprised to hear, he didn't get re-elected. It's seen as a, a big failure. He might have had the right message. He might have had the right target audience, but the context was completely long, wrong. We have to realise that digital um, is not just a place. It is a moment in time for people. You have to reach people in the right context. Now, we look back at the history of life insurance. I think we used to know this and perhaps knew this better. One of the fascinating stories, I think, about life insurance, which a lot of people don't realise, is the hugely influential role it had in the birth and popularisation of country music in the US. If anyone who likes country music, or perhaps anyone who's been to Nashville, you may have heard of a weekly radio show called the Grand Ole Opry. Very famous show, broadcast to millions every week, it's been going for almost 100 years, um, and has made you know, stars out of Johnny Cash, Dolly Parton, uh, etc. What people realise is that it was first broadcast and created by a radio station called We Shield Millions, which was created by a life insurance company called National Life and Accident Insurance in the US. They created this, this radio station, they created the show with country music playing every Saturday evening, going into people's homes. Uh, and if you ever wanted... Um, the context created for the emotions you wanted, grief, loss, regret, remorse, which is very much country music, uh, particularly at those times, perfect. They used to have their salespeople wander around a district on a Saturday evening, listening out to who was listening to the show. They wouldn't go and knock on their door while they were listening. They would come back on Monday morning when it was a better time to speak to them, remind them of the show, and then try to make the sale. So you can create context. It's not just about finding context as well. But one of the great things about digital is it does allow us to find context. It's not, we, you know, we don't want, we're not saying that we need to be creating new genres and music for everyone. The great thing about digital is you can find people in that right moment already. And one of the things we need to understand is something that we call predictive moments. So what's that moment in time, that contextual moment, when people's needs may have already been awakened by circumstance. Well, you don't need to awaken their needs because they already have been awakened. Now there's a bit of behavioral science around here. Um, there's a shortcut that people use to make risk decisions called the availability heuristic. So heuristic is a, is a term for shortcut. Really what this means is that when you're trying to judge how risky something is, you don't do all the research, you know, how often has something happened in the past? How, what are the predictions about whether it will happen in the future? Um, work out the expected value of all those risks. You tend to judge if something is likely to happen by, can you remember it happening before? Um, or is it easy to imagine happening? Is it more available to my mind? The more quickly it comes to mind, the more likely it must be to happen, the more risky it is. 
This is why uh, when it comes to PNC insurance, you often see um, you know, flood insurance sales will go up in one part of the country when you've had floods in another part of the country, even if the risk to that part of the country doesn't change at all, you know, different, um, completely different you know, terrain, etc. But you've seen it all over the news. Perhaps you've had friends or family who suffered from the flood. The risk is so much more available. It's easy to imagine. It's easy to recall happening. Um, and so you're more likely to buy insurance. It's another reason why it's often easier to sell something like cancer insurance than it is life insurance, because cancer has that immediate, emotional, available um, impact on people. I know someone who's had cancer. I read stories about cancer. It's much more available to me. So one of the advantages we have is understanding one of those predictive moments. Now, again, we used to know this in the past, probably in the life insurance industry. Life insurance, particularly in the US, used to be sold at um, airports. So when people were afraid, afraid of flying, when they were in the airport, that risk was available. Um, you can imagine the risk of flying when you're about to board a, a plane. So we used to be good at finding those uh, predictive moments. The question now is, can we still find them? We find them in different ways. We've conducted some research in, in RGA into this. Um, and you know, we found that um, some of the classic um, lifestyle stages still do uh, create predictive moments around life insurance purchases. So buying a home is a trigger point for many people. It awakens their needs. You're more likely to have bought life insurance or to buy life insurance within a 12 month period if you um, just bought a property classic predictive moment. And what online allows you to do now is get there in different ways. So can we build life insurance into the digital mortgage journey as much as it used to be built into the um, advised mortgage journey? Same with having children. Again, a classic moment, a classic lifestyle change. Um, when people have children, they're more likely to have that need awakened. Um, and we've always known this, but digital provides newer ways to perhaps get to people in that moment of need. But what's also interesting from our research is, you know, these are very tangible changes in someone's lifestyle, which create a need for life insurance. But what we found is that other, um, other things trigger and create that predictive moment as well. So we found that people who've recently been bereaved, um, either bereaved if you have dependents yourself or you have no dependents. If you've been bereaved, you've seen a friend or family member die, particularly if they you know, died young, and perhaps left dependents, left children, you are more likely to have bought life insurance and you're more likely to be willing to buy life insurance. Your risk hasn't changed, just like that flood example previously, but the awareness of risk has changed. It's more available to it to you. You can imagine someone dying young and their family struggling because you've seen that. So what digital, I think, allows us to do is to understand and perhaps reach these moments in ways we wouldn't have ever reached them before. That also takes us on to a very hot topic in uh, the insurance world at the moment, this idea of embedded insurance. So can we embed uh, all types of insurance, but particularly uh, life insurance, into those moments that matter to people, into those products? So we talk about house buying, a great moment for people. Let's look about how we can embed it better into the digital mortgage journey as, as it was in the past. People having children, um, it's not just the moment of birth, which is important. There are lots of milestones around kind of being a parent where we can look to embed insurance into those needs more effectively. So when a child first goes to nursery, or goes to school, that kind of need is awakened. Or when you're Charles first doing exams and you're thinking about higher education, again, a moment when a need has been um, awakened. So that's the education point. We, you know, do we do enough to embed um, uh, our sales processes into um, education savings programs and things like that? I would also say, I think the final one, remittances are a great opportunity for thinking about life insurance. When I'm sending money back to someone um, at home, perhaps in a different country, it's probably never more available to me that people are dependent on the money that I earn when I'm sending that money over. Do we make the most that we can of those opportunities? And what I would say about embedded insurance is let's not just think about embedding it into products. Let's think about embedding it into moments, those moments in people's lives when um, those needs have been awakened. It's not that problems are being created. It's about them becoming aware of those needs. So to conclude with that, I explained about identifying problems and needs and, uh, and awakening needs and the key point about technology and humans together. 
I think the key thing we need to remember is, yes, we should be inspired by what we see around us with technological change, but we need to avoid falling into something which has become known as the silicon fallacy. Uh, so to explain that, um, a couple of years ago, probably about three or four years ago now, uh, a hotel in Tokyo in Japan, a very cool, trendy, famous hotel, made an announcement that they were going to get rid of all reception staff. They didn't need reception staff anymore. They could be replaced with robots. Anything the staff could do, the robot, robots could do. So the, the ladies in front of you are robots. They also had a, a robot dinosaur as a receptionist. I've never quite understood why that's the case. Um, but they said, we can get rid of the people. We can just have the robots do it. It's got lots of attention, media attention around the world. Interestingly, about a year, 18 months later, they made another announcement that it had been a complete failure and they were going back to having humans uh, as reception. Why is this? Well, I think they fell into the silicon fallacy here, where just because something can be automated doesn't mean it should be automated and doesn't mean it could be automated successfully. Perhaps it's easy to overlook sometimes what the human brings to a process. So in a hotel reception, it's not just a case of taking your passport details and giving you a key. It's about welcoming you. It's about making you feel safe if you're coming into the lobby late at night. Perhaps it's a friendly face who can give you a bit of advice. Sometimes it's status. You know, if I paid lots of, I want to see lots of staff and well-dressed staff and I want to be greeted, et cetera. Um, by removing the human just because we can often means we don't replace all the good things of the human that we need to do. And we need to focus on this. And Formula One knows this, right? Okay, you don't remove the human um, you know, Formula One could run, I'm sure, on um, you know, self-driving cars now, but it wouldn't be fun. It wouldn't replace, actually, what we, we look for in a sport and entertainment. I'm going to finish with one final slide, one final picture, and a question for you, not a poll question, just a thought to yourself. Do you know who this person is? Now, I suspect most of you don't. I've I've asked a similar question in, in different presentations around the world, even in the US where this person's from and no one really needs, seems to know who it is. Uh, this person is called Ben Feldman. Ben Feldman is the world's most successful ever life insurance salesperson. So operating from like the 1940s to like the early 1990s, uh, so about a 50 year plus career. On his own, he sold $1.8 billion worth of insurance. Uh, at one point, he was selling more insurance himself than about 80% of the US um, insurance companies. And about a third of his sales came after the age of 65. Hugely important figure. Uh, when he died in the 90s, he had obituaries in all the main papers in the US. He was very famous for being a successful salesperson. But hardly anyone in the life insurance industry now knows who he is and talks about him. In what other industry do people forget their most successful people? Um, in engineering, if you ask someone who Nikola Tesla is or Isambard Kingdom Brunel, if you ask an engineer, they'll know who these people are. If you look at Formula One, if you ask drivers, participators, mechanics, who's Nicky Lauda, who's um, Sterling Moss, you know, people don't forget the heroes, the legends of their industry. Why do we forget the past so much? We, just like Formula One, we need to move on and we need to embrace new technologies and we need to always be pushing at the frontiers of things. But we can't forget the lessons of the past as well. We need to combine good lessons from the past with new lessons in the future. But we need to combine the human and the machine. Only by doing the two things together will be as effective as we can be and really look to close the protection gap that we know is so important to us and to people around the world. Thank you. Uh, and all the best to PFA for your underwritten risk sales. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm sure we will all think differently now about how to awaken the need. Please complete the poll questions and have a brilliant day.